I'd like to call the College of Complexes to order, please. I would like to call the College of Complexes to order. It doesn't work. Okay. Um, I would uh, like to call the College to order, please. My name is Tim. I'll be. Uh, I will be. Um, I will be moderating tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. There will first be a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak for up to about an hour. Then we will have questions and answers. During the question time, we ask for questions. After the questions, we'll get into our infamous rebuttal period where you get a chance to rebut the speaker on or either on or off topic. The speaker will get the last word. So hi, hi. Tonight, we have a group called Compassion and Choices. It's the nation's oldest and largest nonprofit organization working to improve care and expand choice at the end of life. With 450,000 supporters nationwide, part of a coalition comprised with the American Civil Liberties Union and Final Options Illinois working to pass aid in dying law. Let's welcome Ed Goble, President of the Illinois Chapter for Compassion and Choices. Let's welcome Mr. Goble. Thank you everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a volunteer with Compassion and Choices and I'm the President of Final Options in Illinois. Um, and yes, the Compassion and Choices, the wonderful national group, and Final Options Illinois, and the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois are part of a coalition and called the Illinois End of Life Options Coalition. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about a very, very, very serious subject, um, dying and death. Uh, and uh, there's no remedy about it. It's a very, very serious subject. It reminds me of. Um, so somebody's coming out of the Costco, and her shopping cart is just overloaded with stuff. Uh, you know, it's the Costco. You buy a lot of stuff. And there's the Grim Reaper in the parking lot waiting for her. And she says, no, not today. Um, so, okay, anyway, so um, here, we have, um, I'm going to pass this clipboard around if you want to, um, if you'd like to receive uh, emails from the coalition, if you want, you can just put your name and your email down and pass it around. And we've got some literature in the back. Um, okay, so, 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 the movement that I'm part of is typically called aid in dying or medical aid in dying. Um, and the way I think of it is it's part of a very broad, we're, we're undergoing a very broad social transformation right now in how people approach the end of their lives. Um, I think, uh, let's see, most of you look to be uh, not children. And you probably had people in your life who are ill, who are ill and died. Um, and you probably know that typically at the end of life there's a lot of suffering. Um, now, a huge chunk of suffering of end of life, you know, suffering goes along with the territory. But one of our goals should be to minimize that suffering. And um, there, are, there are increasingly people recognize this, and increasingly this is not controversial. Um, the way I think of how to minimize suffering at end of life, uh, most importantly, there's about three or four different things that we all should do. Um, one of these, the first one is advanced, advanced directives. Um, an advanced directive, the single most important advanced directive is called the medical power of attorney. It's where you pick a trusted loved one and you give that trusted loved one the legal authority to make medical decisions for you 
if you are unable to make them for yourself. And that's very, very important because often if you're in a hospital or a hospice or a nursing home, you, know, you might be in a coma, you might lose the ability to make decisions for yourself. So that's really, really important. If you know what types of care you want or what types of care you don't want, again, you want somebody to be able to speak for you if you're not capable of speaking for yourself. Um, so that's generically called advanced directives. There's living wills, there's medical power of attorney, there's do not resuscitate, or which is also sometimes called, the, the modern version of this is called POLST, P-O-L-S-T, which is short for Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. So basically, the living will just says, if I am ill, what types of care I might want or don't want. I don't want a feeding tube, I do want a feeding tube. It doesn't really have any legal force. To my mind, the most important one is the medical power of attorney because that has legal force. That means, you know, if, if the doctor wants to do something and you can't speak for yourself, the person who has your medical power of attorney can say, yes, do that or no, don't do that. Um, and then the, the last one, which is also very important if you get to that point, is the do not resuscitate order or the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And that's one that you can't do just by yourself. That's one that requires you do it together with your doctor. It's actually signed by your doctor. And the doctor, it, that's one where you're basically saying, if my heart stops, don't resuscitate me. And I bet a bunch of you understand that, you know, if you're, if you're a very elderly person, if you're a very, very sick person, if you're in the hospital and your heart stops, the uh, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, is a very brutal thing. It involves cracking open your ribs and, um, and the odds that are very high that you're going to die anyway. So typically, you know, the best choice if you're in that situation is to say, no, don't do that. If my heart stops, I just want to die. Um, and historically, that's called a do not resuscitate order. Um, the, it's been replaced by the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, which is also called POLST, P-O-L-S-T. And that one goes a little bit further than the, it, it allows you to say, yes, I don't want uh, CPR, but it also allows you to say, yes, I do or don't want a breathing tube, and or yes, I do or don't want a feeding tube. Um, and you know, that can be very, very important. Um, now, so okay, so advanced directives. Part of the advanced directive, let's go back to the idea that you've, you've assigned, you've identified a loved one to have your medical power of attorney, and you've done the form to give them the medical power of attorney. Um, Clear communication. If, if, you're, if you're doing your loved ones, your children, a favor by bringing up the subject and saying, if my heart stops, let me go. Because they might be very, very hesitant to bring it up with you. But clear communication, talking about it with your loved ones, talking about it with your doctors, telling them what types of care you do want or you don't want. The next part of trying to minimize suffering at end of life would be actually trying to make the right decisions as to what care you do or don't want. A very typical example would be cancer. Okay, let's say you have a form of cancer and it's advanced when it's discovered and uh, the doctor says, I recommend you have a type of chemotherapy. And you have that chemotherapy, and maybe it helps for a while, or maybe it doesn't. And then the doctor says, you know, try this next one. And at some point, the, the, the odds are that the chemo won't help you, and it'll only make your suffering worse. And why ruin your final days or weeks in that situation? In fact, there's a lot of studies that actually show sometimes people with advanced cancer who decline the chemo live longer than people who take the chemo. Now, there's no right answer here. In any situation, we all have to try to make the right decisions for ourselves. And um, 
you know, these are decisions that are very situational and they very much have to do with what our condition is. But, but the key point is, typically, if, if, if we're not dying suddenly, if we, if we die over a period of time as chronic illnesses accumulate, um, we get to a point where the, the aggressive medical treatments are not going to help, they're only going to cause suffering, and we're better off declining them and focusing on comfort care. And then the last part of this is precisely that. It is, it's comfort care. Often this is called palliative care. And this means things like, don't spare the pain medication. Um, now, in our society, um, there is a thing called hospice. And hospice is part of palliative care. Hospice is a thing where you say, okay, I know I'm gonna die soon. I don't want the aggressive treatments. All I want is comfort care, and um, it's paid for under Medicare, hospice. The doctor has to certify that you're reasonably likely to die within six months. Um, hospices can be a good thing or not such a good thing. Like any medical thing, you have to be very skeptical. Find out what they are actually offering. A lot of times people say you're better off, you, know, you should be able to die at home, not in a medical situation with your loved ones there. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not true because often at home you might not be able to get the care you need. In, a, in an inpatient hospice or a nursing home or a hospital, you might actually be able, at the end, people typically, you know, the essence of dying, when, we, when we're born we're helpless, when we go out of this world we're helpless and you need a lot of care and sometimes an inpatient facility can be better. But again, there's no, there's no right answer here, but a common theme is pass on the aggressive medical treatment at the point where you reasonably believe it's only going to be futile and cause suffering or exacerbate your suffering. Choose comfort care, choose palliative care. Okay, so once again, advanced directives, very, very clear communication with your doctors and your loved ones with what you do or don't want. Um, recognizing that often you get to a point where you're better off opting for care, not cure, and then last but not least, taking advantage of the palliative care. I remember when my dad was dying, he was close to 100, he was enrolled in hospice, he was at home. The hospice nurse was saying to my mom, you know, here are these morphine swabs. Swab his, the inside of his mouth with these morphine swabs, it'll make him feel better. And my mom said, no, he'll get addicted. Um, that, that was like a day or two before he died. Okay, when, the essence of comfort and palliative care, if it's really needed, don't spare the opiates, don't spare the morphine. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that I worry about in the current, uh, you know, there's hysteria about opiates and overdoses and so on. Uh, when you're dying, don't worry about it. Okay, so this is all, these are all, what I just described are what I think of as the four pieces of minimizing suffering at end of life. Um, it's rarely pleasant, diving. Um, the goal is to make it less unpleasant. Um, so, and what I just described, these are things that are now increasingly accepted in our society and not controversial. Certainly not, it's certainly not universal. We have a long way to go. Lots and lots of people have horrible deaths, you know, in the ICU when they didn't want that, etc. But um, increasingly these are accepted. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is what we call medical aid in dying, also called aid in dying, um, it used to be called death with dignity, although aid in dying or medical aid in dying have sort of replaced that. Okay? And the way I think of this is often when we're approaching the end, even with the best palliative care, suffering becomes really, really bad. The word I often use is intolerable. Um, dying of cancer that's metastasizing through your body can be very, very unpleasant. Dying of 
M A A L S. Lou Gehrig's disease can be very, very unpleasant. Um, when the doctors say, "Don't worry, we can keep you comfortable," that's not really true. They can minim, they can reduce your suffering, but often suffering is really, really bad and horrible. And you know, just how much suffering one is willing to take in order to stay alive. That's the most personal of choices, okay? And there are many, many people who would never choose to hasten their death for any reason. And that's fine. That's their choice. But we do know there are many, many, many people who, when they get to that situation, often get to the point where their life is unbearable, and all they yearn for is to die. When they die, death comes as a mercy and a relief. Um, I believe that the choice of how much suffering you're willing to bear should be in the hands of the person who is doing the suffering. None of us can know precisely how we're going to feel until we get to that point. I personally am an, I describe myself as an accidental activist in this movement. Um, I got involved in it, oh, 10 or 15 years ago when my wife's dearest friend who had had Parkinson's for more than 20 years and her spine had caved in and she was in a ton of agony and she decided she wanted to die. Um, again, None of us can know how we're going to feel. I, I describe it as ironic because I'm a person with a very, very strong fear of death. I don't. Know, I can't personally envision taking that leap into eternity, but that's because I, I feel great right now. But I know that people get to that point where all they want to do is die, and that's what the medical aid in dying movement is about, which is providing people with that choice. Okay, so the modern movement. How am I doing on time? When? When? Okay. okay. Doing fine. So, so let me tell you again. This is great because you folks say you know an hour. That's a lot of time here to talk about this. So I'm telling, and you're a fascinating group. So I'm going to tell you stories. So the modern movement for aid and dying was started by a guy named Derek Humphrey. He was a Brit. He was married to Jean. Her wife had had a very, her mom had had a very bad death from breast cancer. Um, she got breast cancer. She said to him, you know, I don't want to go through what my mom did. Can you help me? He went off, this was in the 70s. He went off to a famous doctor in, in Britain on Harley Street, told the guy the story. The guy said, you must never tell anybody what I'm about to do. He went to the medicine cabinet, he gave Derek the needed meds, he told Derek what to do. Derek went home to Jean, he said, dear, I have what you need. She said to him, promise me if I ever ask you for it, you will give it to me, no questions asked. He said, I will. Time went on, she got sicker. One day she said, today is the day. He gave her the meds, she drank them down, she died peacefully. He waited a year, he wrote a book about this. It's called Jean's Way. There was this immense hullabaloo in Britain. They threatened to prosecute him. He, he said to the prosecutor, go ahead, prosecute me if you want. If you do, I will plead guilty and throw myself on the mercy of the court. They declined to prosecute him. He moved to Los Angeles. He founded the Hemlock Society, and that must have been around 1980. Okay. Uh, over time, the Hemlock Society, it grew pretty soon, and there were local Hemlock Societies all over the place. Um, it, it grew, it changed its name to End of Life Choices, it merged with a group in Washington State called Compassion and Dying, and the result is today the very sizable and wonderful and effective group, Compassion and Choices, for which I am a volunteer, and Amy Sherman sitting over there is the campaign manager for a bunch of Midwestern states, including Illinois. Um, 
Compassion and Choices describes its mission as expanding care and improving choice at the end of life, and that's fundamentally what it's about. It's about providing people with a choice. If you get to that point, if you are terminally ill, then it should be your choice as to how much suffering you're willing to accept, and if you're not willing to accept that suffering, you should have the means to a peaceful, dignified, humane, and pain-free death, your doctors and your loved ones should be able to provide that means and help you, okay? So, this movement has been percolating for decades now. Um, it first uh, achieved its first success in the United States, in Oregon, in 1994, when there was a ballot initiative that was passed to establish an aid and dying law. Um, it was held up by a legal challenge. It was passed again in 1997 by ballot initiative by an even wider margin, and then it went into effect. Um, that was in 1997, so it's been in effect for more than 20 years. Um, this was followed by Washington State passing a ballot, in, ballot initiative in 2008. Um, Vermont and Montana followed. Uh, Vermont was an action of the legislature. Montana was an action of the state Supreme Court. Uh, in 2015, California passed an aid and dying law. It went into effect in 2016. Colorado passed this by ballot initiative in 2016. Um, Hawaii passed a law in the legislature. This year it takes effect on January 1. Uh, Washington, D.C. passed a law, I think in 2016, which is in effect. So we're up to seven states, California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Montana, Vermont, Hawaii, and Washington State, and Washington, D.C., where aid and dying laws are on the books. It's about one in five Americans. Aid and dying is legal all across Canada. It's legal in a number of European countries, and in, in Australia, I think, in the state of Victoria. And it's this immense worldwide movement of which Compassion and Choices is a part. So, the Oregon law. The Oregon law very, very, very carefully um, designed, and all the laws we have in the United States are modeled after the Oregon law. It's been in effect for more than 20 years. There's not been a single case of abuse or coercion or anything like that. Okay, so what are the parameters of the Oregon law? All right, so, you know, you go to your doctor and you say, Doc, I want out. Um, now, no doctor is obligated to participate in this, and even the ones that support it will obviously exercise their ethical judgment. You go there and you say, Doc, I got a hangnail. They'll say no. But again, let's say you're terminally ill. So the doctor has to agree that you're terminally ill, likely to die within six months in their reasonable medical judgment. It's basically the same criteria for um, being eligible for Medicare's hospice benefit, okay? So again, you have to be terminally ill, likely to die within six months. The doctor has to agree that you are mentally capable. You know what you're doing. Why are you being aggressive? You're just pushing this old man around. Okay, the doctor has to agree that you're mentally capable. You know what you're doing. You're making an informed decision. Go where? And the doctor, another do the doc, your doctor has to bring in another doctor to consult. So basically, two doctors have to agree you're mentally capable, you're making an informed decision, um, and you're terminally ill. If either doctor has the slightest doubt as to whether you're mentally capable, whether you know what you're doing, etc., they are legally obligated to refer you for evaluation to a licensed mental health professional, somebody, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but not somebody who just hangs out a shingle. They have to be licensed by the state. Um, and only if that person concludes that you are mentally capable may the process continue. So once again, two doctors, uh, terminally ill, mentally capable, making an informed decision, multiple requests. Typically you have to make three requests. You make an initial oral request, 
you make another oral request, you make a final written request. You sign an official form, this is what I want. Um, that written request has to be witnessed by at least one person without any expectation of financial gain in your estate. Again, we're trying, they're putting, they're putting protections in there, okay? Um, typically, there are waiting periods. The, Oregon, the original Oregon law had an initial two-week waiting period, followed by a 48-hour waiting period, okay? And if, so if all of these conditions are true, the doctor can write you a prescription. Um, typically, people go fill the prescription, they put the meds on the shelf, if their suffering gets too bad, they take, they drink them down, they go to sleep, they have a peaceful death. Um, the, criti the really, really, really critical thing that the law says is that you have to, quote unquote, self-administer the medication. Your loved ones can mix it up for you. They can hand you the drink but you have to be the one to drink it down. The final act, the thing that causes your death, has to be something that you do yourself, not something that is done to you. And that is the ultimate protection against any kind of abuse, obviously. Um, the law doesn't specify precisely what medication the doctor may prescribe, but in the classic Oregon, uh, in, in, most of the, in most of the time, you know, the classic medication is an overdose of barbiturates. Back in the 50s and 60s, these things were prescribed as sleeping pills like candy, but there were lots of deaths. It was very, very easy to overdose on these barbiturates. But typically, it will be liquid nebutol or powdered secanol. You take, uh, like an hour before, you take something to make sure there's no chance of your, your vomiting. You, you drink the stuff down, you're typically in a coma in a few minutes. And you're typically gone in about an hour. It's a very, very peaceful death. Um, and again, it's all about choice. No one, the way I feel, no one should ever be pressured into doing this. No one should ever be coerced into doing this. No one, I, I personally feel no one should ever do this because they're worried about using up the inheritance or they can't get the care they need. I, I believe a compassionate society provides people with care. I personally believe health care should be a human right. So, um, again, you... But again, it's your choice. Now, typically in a state like Oregon, it's, tip, it's maybe it's 1%, 2% of people who die every year. It's not large. The percentage has been slowly increasing over time. Um, the laws require, so far, the laws have all required that individual cases have to be reported to the state health department. And um, the individual stories are confidential medical records, but the state health department provides a, an annual statistical abstract as to how many people are, you know, getting the, the prescriptions, what they're, what they're suffering from, um, whether they used it or not. Typically, for the people who go through the process and get the prescription, more than half of them end up using it and a bunch of them end up not using it, um, which is fine. That's, that's what it's all about. Often, just having that medicine on the shelf gives people an incredible sense of relief because they know if it gets way too bad, they've got a way out. And that gives them the courage to keep going on another day, another day, until some acute event happens and they die. Okay. So, um, you know, these laws are a truly wonderful thing. Um, they're not for everyone. Um, if you are somebody who believes for out of, you know, religious beliefs or whatever, that you could never do this, it's all in God's hands, then that's fine. That's your choice. Um, lots of people who who feel that way when they're healthy, though, don't necessarily feel that way when they're sick. Um, and uh, certainly in many cases, or in 
lots of cases. I don't, I don't know how to put a percentage on it. Again, palliative care, advanced directives, these can all minimize your suffering. There's a wonderful new book out by a, a doctor named Samuel Harrington that talks about, you know, choose when to, to opt for comfort care only and then let the acute event carry you away because that's going to be the peaceful way to go. Um, so, again, not for everyone. Uh, no need for it to be for everyone. It, it, I, I, don't, I, I really believe that this transformation is happening. It's going to take a while. Um, it'll be interesting to see in the end. This is going to become part of the standard of medical care, that, to offer this choice to people. And um, as it becomes more widely, uh, it, it's anybody's guess as to what percentage of people will ultimately opt for this. Again, so far it's one or two percent. And you know, that, that does make sense. Again, I, I um, you know, life is precious. We don't, people who choose this, they say over and over and over again, I don't want to die but I know what's coming in how I'm going to die if I don't take this way out. Um, there's a movie that we show a lot. Uh, it's a documentary. It's called How to Die in Oregon. It was filmed in 2008. It follows the story of a woman named Cody Curtis who suffers from... Uh, she had, she, she had uh, an advanced liver cancer when it was discovered. And uh, she had surgery. She was in. The, she had complications. She was in the hospital for uh, you know months and months. She slowly recovered. Uh, she had a period where she felt better. Then the cancer came back. She fought it. She fought it. And and ultimately, though, at the end, she said, "I had no idea it was going to be like this. This is not what I signed up for." And she ended up using the meds, and dying peacefully. Um, so, and I have been with loved ones who have done this, and Thank you. Uh, it can be a beautiful thing, because again, it's, it's a freely chosen choice, and people are avoiding suffering, and often you can do it in a way, you know, with your loved ones there, your friends there, you can say goodbye. Um, you know, I like to think if I'm dying, I'm going to throw a party and invite all my friends to come. Who knows how I'll feel. Um, but, but again, it, this, that's what the movement about, is, is all about. Medical aid in dying. It's about, it's about making legal change so that this option is available to people who are mentally capable, terminally ill adults. Making a freely chosen choice. Um, okay, so... So, so now let me tell you a few other things about laws like this. Okay, you know, there are laws on the books that are uh, against prohibiting assistance in a suicide. Okay, so, um, you know, if somebody walked up to me, if a young, if a young man walked up to me and said, uh, um, you know, I just asked Susie to the prom and she said, no, I want to kill myself. If I handed that person a gun, that would be assisting in a suicide. That would be a very serious felony. Um, these law, the, the medical aid in dying law, do not overturn laws against assisting in a suicide. What they do is they say that legally this is not suicide. Okay? They mandate that if you take advantage of the law, your underlying illnesses are listed on your death certificate as the cause of. <coughs> Okay? And also what that means, so for example, uh, I imagine many of you folks have life insurance policies and when you take out a life insurance policy, there's usually, there's always what's called an exclusion period, which is typically six months. If you take out that, that life insurance policy and you kill yourself in two months, they don't pay. Okay? Um, if an insurance company was silly enough to sell you a policy when you were terminally ill, you took out that policy, and two months later, you ended your life through a medical aid and dying law, that insurance company would be obligated to pay because legally, you did not commit suicide. So, this is not suicide. It's not suicide in the legal sense, and it's not suicide in the moral sense. Um, when, when people think about suicide, 
normally what people think of as the irrational act of a person suffering from mental illness or depression, often extremely impulsive, often some, you know, somebody who doesn't want to live. People who are taking advantage of medical aid and dying are typically at the other end of the extreme. They're, they're very rational. They might be very depressed because they're dying and they're suffering, but they're not suffering from mental illness or clinical depression. They're making an only too clear choice. So we draw, again, we draw a very sharp distinction between suicide and medical aid in dying. Um, the, there's a, it's a professional organization called the American Association of Suicidology. Um, that likewise agrees. Medical aid in dying is not committing suicide. The old term for this was physician-assisted suicide, and it is falling out of use. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's what the movement is about. It's about expanding care and choice at end of life, because medical aid in dying is only one part of it. It's the, it's the critical part of it, but it's only one part of it. Again, I, I, I can guarantee if we went around this room, I bet everybody here has stories to tell about their loved ones and whether their death was a good death or a bad death and what, what could have been done better, and et, et cetera. Um, so, so medical aid in dying is only one part of that much broader movement. But to my mind, it's the very, very critical part. You know, I, I'm someone who's read about this a lot, I think about it a lot, and, you know, when I get ill, I'm going to try to make the, I'm still able to make these choices, I'm going to try to make the right choices to, um, you know, minimize my suffering. Um, but even with that, suffering can be extreme, and without this legal change, there's an awful lot of people who are going to have horrible, horribly cruel, horribly painful, horribly barbaric deaths. And that's why this movement is so important. Uh, sometimes we say it's about choice. Sometimes we say it should be a human right. Again, if you're terminally ill and you're adult and you're mentally capable, it should be your right to choose how much suffering you're willing to accept. Doctors should be protected if they help you exercise that choice. Loved ones should be protected if they help you exercise that choice. And that's what it's all about. Um, here in Illinois, there, there campaigns, this is a worldwide movement. It's immense. In South Africa, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, this incredible moral voice, has been speaking out in favor of this now for, for years and years. Um, we advocate in Illinois for a medical aid in dying law, just like the ones on the books in these other seven states. Um, and we hope that our progressive legislators in Illinois bring forward such a bill, possibly soon. We don't know when we're going to be ready to bring it forward. It could be next year. So that's why I say that, um, again, if this is something that you feel that you would like to help bring about, um, I would say the first thing to do would be to sign that email sheet. So we, if you're on email, so you're, you're, you'll get email from the organizations in the coalition, including Compassion and Choices. Um, the second one would be to go to the Compassion and Choices website, sign up, Send them a few bucks, or more, um, and but get get plugged into the cause. Um, and you know, if you are part of uh, a church, an organization, a union, uh, you know, give us a call, and um, you know, we're happy to provide speakers. And I see my colleague, Ms. Amy Sherman walking on up, and once again, she is the campaign manager for Compassion and Choices, and I'm going to let her come on up. All right. 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 All
I don't need. I don't no, need. you do because they're filming. Oh, I, I, I just first of all, I wanted to thank you all for being here. I think this is such a phenomenal event and group. The fact that you get together really for learning and really for exchanging ideas and thoughts. We need more of that. Um, I just joined Compassionate Choices. I've known Eddie for many, many years. I've cared about this for my own reasons, personal stories. Um, and the thing that I think is really important here is we're trying to talk about options. That this is really um, about people having control of their body, of their death. We are not saying hasten death. We're saying have a peaceful death. People should be able to choose tools to have a peaceful death and not suffer. So I think if you think of it that way, it's, it, you know, is this really that controversial? Unfortunately, for some it is. Um, and the big thing, like with many controversial things, we're not saying everybody needs to do this or should choose it, just having the option. So just wanted to reinforce that piece of this. If you're interested in getting involved, a part of why I was uh, actually hired by CNC is to help organize people. We have action teams where we work together, and it's, it's done by locale and also by constituency. And it's, you know, we would train you, we would help you become ambassadors and advocates and champions. <laughs> Think about it, um, because it's, it's, it's good to learn about this and get smart for your own life in managing these things. I know I, I had to learn a ton when I was going through this with my mom. Um, and it's not something easily accessible, this information. You have to kind of look for it to get it. Um, please use the Compassion Choices website. There are tons of resources on it, really worth going to if you're ever in this situation or you have a loved one or somebody who needs advice. Um, also, Final Options Illinois has information. But what we really would like, for those of you who feel you have the time and inclination, let us know if you'd like to get a little more involved in this. You know, we, we'll take you where you are and how much you can do. But this won't happen unless we all get together and say, make it happen. And we actually do have, as Ed said, um, you know, now a much more promising political landscape. I don't know if it'll be a year or even two for the bill, but I feel like if there was ever a chance that we can do this, it takes time to pass a bill. If there's ever a chance, this is now. I mean, this is one we really need to get out, talk to our representatives, you know, try to get out there and talk to some of the constituencies. For example, like your doctor, really good person for you to have a conversation with, um, and start to really help educate people. Now, if you, you know, feel like there are problems with this, I respect that. You know, we're in a country, people have different views about this, and that's totally okay. I think, again, it gets to allowing people to have their own choice. So I'm going to leave it at that. I just want you to see me, so if you wanted to, to come up and say hi. And I know there's questions for Ed, no, right? St stay up here. But, stay but up there. You know, you know what? You're I just give up that easy. Here, hang on, hang on. I want to. I want to. There's one more, one or two things. One more thing I re remembered that I wanted to cover. One more thing I remembered that I wanted to cover. Um, the public support for this is in the 70s. It's most people. You know, if you've lived to a certain age, you've, you've seen your loved ones suffer and die, public support for this is very high. It cuts across uh, ethnic lines, it cuts across religious lines. When the ballot initiative passed in Colorado in 2016, the vote was two to one. It was 66% in favor. That was higher. That was higher than the percentage that voted for marijuana legalization in, in Colorado that year. So obviously, it, cut, it cuts across political lines. It cuts across religious lines. Um, doctors increasingly support this. There's a, a, a doctors group called Medscape that. Um, uh, I think about two years ago, they did a survey. More than 50% of doctors support this. It's not surprising, and medical and opinion is very changing very fast. It's not surprising because doctors know what dying is like. There's a lot of studies that show that when doctors die, they tend to avoid the aggressive medical care at end of life. Um, opinion within the medical profession is, as I say, it's shifting fast. There are 10 state medical societies so far that have dropped their opposition to medical aid and dying and have adopted a neutral position. 
And, you know, obviously, unanimity, there's no unanimity among doctors, but what's really going on there when, when a state medical society says we're neutral, what they really mean is we support this. A majority of doctors in the, on the leadership of the state medical society supports it. Um, and they're saying individual doctors can vote their conscience. Um, so 10 state medical societies so far, and even within the American Medical Association, the AMA has long had a prohibition on quote-unquote physician-assisted suicide. A few years ago, a very famous Oregon doctor, Dr. John Rowe, he wrote a piece for the Journal of the American Medical Association. He said, you know, the palliative care doctors say they can keep you comfortable. We all know this is not true. And he actually ended his life with the Oregon aid and dying law. Um, re very recently, the AMA had a commission that they put together to consider their policy and whether it should be changed. And they studied the subject. And they basically wrote a report saying the policy should be changed, but we recommend not changing it. They brought, because the, the guy who headed that group was opposed to it. They brought that recommendation to the American Medical Association House of Delegates. The AMA House of Delegates voted to reject the report. They said, go study it some more. And the story that I heard was that they replaced that guy with someone who was more supportive. So again, I, I reasonably believe that the Doctors are coming. Uh, there's a very, very strong base of support for this. It will happen. You know, politicians tend to follow rather than lead on controversial subjects like that, like this. And and this is this is why it's up to all of us to help make this transition happen. So thank you very, very much, and bring the questions up. Yeah, and I and I want to say because this is important. Some of the opinions that Eddie just shared with you are his personal opinions. They're not all compassionate choices, and we, I don't know if we distinguish that. Just so many, you know, we love your opinions, but they're just, I just want to make that clear um, in terms of what the doctors are doing and what they're thinking. Yeah. That's that's Eddie's analysis of the situation. So, um, anyhow, just to clarify that. But are there are there uh, comments or questions? Oh, yeah, a lot oh, yeah. Of them. Okay. Everybody's jumping. Oh, okay. Uh, usually, usually you call on us. There's usually a moderator up here. Oh, okay. He's absent okay. tonight. I'm, I'm happy to just facilitate right. it. Okay, here. fine. Go ahead. All right. And say I would, who you are, please. My name is Tim. I'm sort of the uh, unofficial chief pet, supposedly here at the college, right under Charlie. I'd like to know a little bit more about your personal stories and why you got involved with the movement. I understand you're hired, you're paid. But you, some, something about your mother and, and then yours too, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, well, my mom. Use the mic again, please. Um, oh yeah, I keep forgetting. My mom uh, uh, was pretty amazing. Uh, she was a psychiatric social worker who refused to retire. She worked until she was 80, and uh, really a community activist and very cerebral. She had two master's degrees, and for a woman at that, of that generation, that was very unusual. Um, so her brain was very important to her, and she ended up getting Alzheimer's, and uh, it was a slow 10-year journey, but at the very last, it was very, very difficult. Now, in dying, in this, this scenario, probably wouldn't apply to her, because she could not, you know, be looked at as mentally competent, but it made me aware of how awful death can be, um, and it made me very sensitive. Prior to that, um, Ed was talking about um, a, a woman that he, uh, he'll talk about Lola, and although she wasn't as close to me, I knew her, and that very much affected me that she was able to make that choice for herself and the difference between those two experiences. I personally believe that um, this is about having, you know, uh, dominion over my own body. Um, and so that's why I think this is very important. Um, and again, I want to make it clear, I don't know what I'll do when I'm in this position, if I'm in this position, you know, I don't know. I mean, and I, I just want to have the option. That's really what the issue is for me. That's really what I'm focused on. I also want to mention, and, and Ed talked a little bit about it, I mean, palliative care is, is great. I'm not, I mean, C&C supports palliative care. Um, we want to ease suffering um, and, and hospice care. You know, there's, there's, 
these are not either or dynamics here. These are tools and resources when you're getting into that phase. The, the issue is can you have this option as well? I think that's really the way to frame that issue. So I don't know. So let me uh, hand this over to you to talk about Mullen. Yeah, in, in in Oregon, where the law has been in effect for the longest in the U.S., um, it's it, there's studies that show that it improves palliative care. Everybody who takes advantage of the law, almost without exception, is enrolled in hospice and is getting the palliative care. Um, let's see. Uh, my wife's dearest friend, who had, had Parkinson's and her spine had caved in, and she was in agony. She ended her life through medical aid and dying. Um, let's see. I had a, my sister who was five years older than me. She died at age 56 of ovarian cancer. It was very advanced when it was discovered. She had the surgery. She, she, she was in hell for two months. After the surgery, nothing moved in her intestine ever again. Um, my son died of in 01 of uh, it was liver. It was ocular melanoma that went to his liver. It was discovered that it, that it had gone to his liver was discovered way too late. He had a horrible death. He was only, I think, 40. Um, let's see. Uh, my wife had a very, very horrible death from leukemia about two years ago. Um, my mom and dad uh, died. Um, my dad made it to 90, almost to 100. My mom made it to 97. They both were examples of taking advantage of palliative care at the end. But again, I, I, you know, I was laughing when you were for a second when you talked about this because I'm I'm a I'm a very educated layperson on this. I decided when I was like 11 or 12 years old, don't want don't want to be a doctor. Nothing to do with blood or anything like that. But you know, I've had uncles. I mean, I have I have had. I don't think I'm unique. I mean, I think, you know, I'm 65 years old. If, you know, if you live to a certain age, and unless you're, you know, you're living under a rock, you have loved ones who died, and, and you know, you know how, how bad it can be. So, um, um, okay. that's, that's what, that's how it got me in. Go ahead, sir. Can, can a hospital demand that you have 24-hour care before you're released? So you're sick, very sick, and so, like, like my brothers, they, they, they said you must have 24-hour care. And they wouldn't release them. I, I think that depends on uh, probably the state and what the circumstances this are. State. I don't think. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, it, here I'm going to make a guess, which oh, is boy. the social worker there probably has some obligation before they discharge you to see if you're going to be okay if you're discharged. And if they think you need the 24-hour care, but again, that's just a guess. I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't think we can comment on that. Um, the hospital says know. they're afraid that, that he, he might make a lawsuit. You know. Oh well, uh, well, that's. I mean, that's really hard for us to address. Yeah. But uh, um, you know, normally, you, you know, I wouldn't think a hospital can say, "Well, we're going to keep you here because you're going to make a lawsuit." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I wish I could give you more information. We don't have it. Okay, who is I'm, I'm a nurse with the VA, and I work with, I'm a nurse with oh, the VA, good. and I work with a lot of, I, I, I do referrals for palliative care in hospitals. I think it's important to differentiate in Illinois anyway, under Medicare, there is palliative care and there is hospice, and they come under an umbrella of the palliative care services, but Palliative care in the home is minimal. You might get a nurse coming out once a month. And and hospice is variable depending on the agency. They're not mandated to a minimum number of visits. Um, and I find that I have to monitor my hospice agencies to make sure they maintain an adequate standard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to say to you, first of all, thank you for working with the VA. Oh. I've done a lot of work with veterans in my career they, and other back. things. And, you know, it's, it's a joy they're to be really, there. Yeah, it's important, and, and thank you. It's a um, joy to be there. Good, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, I've always felt that way about the work that I've done with veterans. Um, I, I will say this. Um, I also, I didn't mention this in my personal experience, but we had hospice for my mom um, in, in the, in the at late stage, and I didn't have a good experience with hospice. Um, really didn't. I mean, just, it, it, didn't, it did not go well. Um, probably... Um, you know, is that agency? I mean, you can't assume because somebody's hospice, you're absolutely right. You have to be empowered, be a, be a very informed consumer. I also know of many, many people who had very good experiences with hospice. And, and in fact, my um, 
my sister-in-law is actually a hospice uh, nurse and talks about sort of the work that she's done. She, she's not in the state. But I mean, I think it's just with any kind of care, um, you know, we, we can't really afford to be passive. Um, and that sometimes we're not the ones who can advocate for ourselves. That's where that medical power of attorney becomes really important. But you know, the, the best thing is to have at least somebody who is paying attention for you. And it's important to realize you can change uh, hospice agencies. You're not satisfied exactly with right. the care. You have the right to make a change. Yeah, that's really right. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also important to distinguish between inpatient hospice and right. home hospice. That's true. Um, <laughs> and with inpatient hospice, with home hospice, the services may not be what you need. Um, there's actually a, people who say, you know, die at home and you're comfortable surroundings. Um, there's a wonderful new book by, a, 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 she's actually a hospice nurse, her name is Sally Tisdale. It's called Advice for Future Corpses. Sally Tisdale, Advice for Future Corpses. And that's one of the things she talks about at great length, which is at the end, often you need lots of care and you might be better off in an inpatient facility, whether that's a hospice inpatient or a nursing home or even a, a, a hospital palliative care unit or a hospital, um, you need a lot of care. Um, and, okay. and, and then I want to mention, as long as I'm mentioning books, there's another incredibly wonderful new book. Um, let's see, it, I, what is the title? It's at, I think it's called At Peace. It's by a doctor named Samuel Harrington. And again, he's giving very, very practical advice about how to choose when you're going to be best off by hopping off the medical conveyor belt. I, I just want to say that it's my understanding that Medicare pays a flat rate for hospice. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Yeah, Medicare pays a flat rate for hospice regardless of how much service the hospice agency delivers. So they have, in, and some of them are for profit, they have an incentive to give minimum care. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I, yeah we have a lot of system issues around it, yeah. no question. Now you're next. Yes. What about body donations to science? Can you elaborate on all of that? Well, I know my, my, my father did that. And uh, you know there are registries for doing that, and uh, you can go with the Secretary of State. And you know, I know you can do organ donation through that. Um, I don't know much about with medical schools. I know, I mean, I know there are ways to donate to that. Do you know anything about that? Well, I mean, again, the most important thing when you go, when you redo your driver's license, or when you, um, you know, if you just get your state ID card, make sure it has that thingy on it that says you're an organ donor. So if you if you die, any 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 organs that they can use can help other people. One follow. Go ahead. Well, suppose you uh, assign somebody, you know, the family member to do this for you, to assist you, and they back down. Is there, does the law provide somebody? Uh, uh, in terms the, of enforcing the, the, well, the power suppose they of back attorney? Down. Yeah, suppose they back down on this thing. How do you, what's your turn? Well, that's well, again, I, I don't know what you mean by back down, because again, the, the ultimate, if you do this, it, it all requires self-administration, quote unquote. Yeah. It's something you do for yourself. So it's not something that is done to you. Right. I don't, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like it would apply to this. I mean, Nobody uh, helps you with it. Well, a person, uh, you know, your family can certainly help you in terms of reaching out to the doctor, right. but the doctor has to do the assessment with you. Um, you know, they can even, um, you know, mix the thing up, but you ultimately have to be the one who administers it to yourself under this, this law. Um, okay, we had somebody back here. Well, well, I've got to make sure to be really respectful of people here. Back here in the corner. Yes, we're glasses. Is there anybody running this thing? They're self doing it, Charlie, as you said, we said earlier. Because I'm okay. filming. I just want to see that shirt. Don't worry, we're good. We're all good. We're good. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, helping someone to uh, take their life. Uh, I don't think that should be the province of the doctor because the doctor is sworn to a good life. Rather, shouldn't it be the province of, say, the undertaker, where you would sign up and, and have a number of witnesses and then they would carry on from there? Well, one could say also doctors are there to alleviate suffering. And um, so it could, you, know, you could say doctors really, it is in their purview. And also, the kind of assessment that needs to be made to make sure there's safeguards really and really does require a doctor's involvement in this. So, you know, under this model. 
So I don't think that, I'm not sure an undertaker would feel comfortable doing something like that, quite frankly. I just, I just don't see them taking on that role under the way things currently work, you know. Well, um, the undertaker does not make an oath to preserve and okay. protect. Okay, okay. Let, me, we, let, we, me, we, let me talk about that. Yeah. If you actually, uh, go, go read your Hippocrates. Is it Hippocrates? Hippocratic. Yeah. Hippocratic. Hippocrates, he wrote yeah. the Hippocratic yeah. Oath. Right. The, the first duty of a doctor is to relieve suffering. This is part of relieving suffering. And, and we need to be real, at the end, death is coming anyway. It's not a question of choosing whether to die or not to die, it's a question of how you die. So I, I believe, in fact, you know, I'm glad you raised that point, because I think about this an awful lot from an ethical and moral point of view. I mean, the doctor is not assisting you, the doctor is not killing you. Under these laws, really, the doctor is acting as the gatekeeper. The doctor is saying there's a set of circumstances when this is okay, but it's still something you do for yourself. Um, I believe that for doctors to help their patients die in this way, or for loved ones to help their for people to help their loved ones die in this way, I believe this is the highest form of compassion. My that's one of the things that my experience in this has taught me. It is the highest form of compassion, because at the end, suffering would be horribly extreme. Okay, okay. Um, let's make sure, we get, okay, I, did you already give the question? Yes, okay, yeah. here we go, uh, yeah. man uh, in the red sweater. Yeah, um, per the uh, possibilities with people that opt for wanting to preserve their body or at least uh, their head and brain after death, uh, what are the pros and cons of uh, selecting this um, aid in ending life? Well, it doesn't affect, affect anything in your body. I mean, you're, you're, you go to sleep, basically. That's what it is. It shuts you down. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's basically a peaceful death. So what you do after that is, is you know, well, like it's beyond, beyond, beyond the scope of this. I can see a pro because if you are in danger of Alzheimer's, you'd at least be able to not let that prolong and, and well, cause your brain Here's damage. the thing with Alzheimer's. Um, uh, first of all, you have to be mentally competent when you're making this decision. Right. And you also have to be terminal, which means there has to be a reasonable likelihood of death within six months. And, um, you know, for, I mentioned to you my mom. My mom would not have applied in this case because it was a 10-year journey with my mom um, before she passed away from Alzheimer's. It often takes, you know, takes a long time. Yeah, it's um, not because she doesn't suffer either. Well, that's true. You know, that's an issue um, that at this point, I mean, we're not, we're looking into the issue of, of particularly dementia because there's so much happening with dementia now. There is um, an option, and, and people do this, where they voluntarily, they decide I'm not gonna eat or drink um, as a way to uh, address this. Um, so that's an option for people in that situation at this point, um, and sometimes people aren't aware that that's an option for, they're really suffering, that's something they can do. Um, I, I have to say with my mom, she just started, she just started you know, eating less and less and drinking less and less, that was sort of a part of it the shutdown that was happening with her. So, um, let's go in the back. Okay, which one? Yeah, is, is there any opposition by the organized religions that uh, what you are up to or advocating? Are there any hospitals uh, uh, that don't like you? Well, there's. I would say, you know, the biggest opposition typically has been from the Catholic Church. Um, uh, and you can see why, it's pretty obvious that there'd be some differences in views around death and what it means, um, and uh, the issue around um, somebody taking control in terms of when they're dying. I mean, I think they have a very different view of what that process is. Um, there are also, um, you know, uh, at least specific religious institutions that have been, you know, uh, supportive and, and open-minded about it. Eddie, do you want to? Yeah. I mean, here, I'll say, I'll say one thing. If you are a person who, let's forget medical aid and dying for the moment. If you're a person who wants the ability to refuse aggressive medical treatment at the end, be careful about ending up in Catholic hospitals that will 
try not to honor your wishes. It depends on the hospital. Be, be careful. Um, we have to ask. The, the yeah. point is you need to really specifically ask um, before you get in that situation. So you're, whoever your power of attorney needs to be educated that this is your wish to know to know to check that because you may have to transfer from that hospital. Right, right. But, but yeah, the, the, the opposition typically comes from what I call certain misguided um, wings of the of the religious community. Um, but I think this, I think ultimately aid in dying will become, the, it'll just become the part of the accepted medical practice because it's something that's so obviously right. And it's all about choice. It's never about forcing anybody to do something. Absolutely. Here, here, right there, no, right there. Okay. Uh, could you talk about uh, something I have believed for a long time that, for example, in Scandinavia or Sweden, uh, death, you're, you're entitled to uh, end your life if you want to. It isn't even a question. And so I think there's a lot of different cultural nuances that you could cite. I'm just wondering if you do a little anthropological study of the people who, who say it's okay to end your life and, you know, is that, is that anything that you... You mean reflect on the, the yeah, I yeah. mean, I think that in some cultures it's uh, considered normal. Well, I, I mean, I know even in, it's true, um, and we talk some of the Scandinavian, but they, you know, they have also their challenges. I've been reading some things where there's pushback on a certain case. So even in cultures where there's maybe a different view around dying, um, you know, you still have to be vigilant and there needs to be activism. But I think, you know, in our culture, um, you know, we have a very, we, we, I mean, we, our culture is grounded in a lot of, uh, in, you know, historically in some religious views and um, our also um, our medical industry has been very much about prolonging life, long, 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 old, you know, how many years is a big factor versus maybe the quality of the years. Um, and so, you know, we, we're living with this culture. And so how do we help people? And I mean, to me, this is a very personal thing. I mean, it, it should not be, you know, mandated. Uh, I think that would be a problem. It's just it should be an option. But to allow people to have a really thoughtful, um, reflection, examination, and also discussions. I mean, it, you know, one of the things that's been really great about working at Compassion and Choices so far is the ability to have a conversation about this. I mean, I don't know about how many of you when you were growing up talked about this? How many of you talked to your loved ones about this? I mean, good. I mean, but that's pretty, that's pretty rare. I mean, most families, you know, I'll talk to my friends you know, they get very uncomfortable when I talk about their parents or, you know, how they're going to deal with it. It's, it's something that's kind of kept close. And I think we need to somehow unclench from this topic so that we can decide in a rational way how we can be as humane as possible about it. Eddie, you want to talk about us? Um, no, you said it all. Okay. Um, wait a minute. What are, the gentleman in the back. Okay. <clears throat> a, uh, uh, an early and famous... Um, proponent of the uh, uh, this choice, these rights that you're talking about, was Dr. Kavorki. And I was curious uh, what your personal opinion was on his impact on the movement. Well, one thing, I mean, it's different because that was where he was actively engaged um, in, uh, in the experience of death. I mean, so he, had, he played a very different role than the doctors do under this this model that we're talking about um, where the person themselves is taking control of that decision um, and not administering it um, I mean I, I did, did he help the help this you know I mean this is just a personal opinion I think he uh, maybe you know got dialogue about it but a lot of it was backlash and and probably gave a lot of material <coughs> for opposition from that so you know um, you know ch change is hard um, and um, I think what's important, you know, and what we do at Compassionate Choices is we're, we're very practical. I mean, we're really trying to think about, you know, what makes sense within our culture for the people, you know, who uh, are experiencing this, what, what's, what's going to resonate um, among um, uh, policy leaders, um, you know, uh, uh, physicians, etc. all the really important constituents in addition to everybody in the community. Um, so that's where we put our focus on. Um, and um, I think uh, when you get into physicians taking more than the role that we're talking about, 
it starts to get very, very, it gets to be a very difficult conversation. What do you think? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. There, right he there. He has another yes, question. Okay, what happened and then, if you guys fail, quit, go to Hollywood, become account managers tomorrow? What happened on Monday? I want to commit suicide. How, how did you know that I'm planning on going to Hollywood <laughs> on Monday? <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, first of all, we are not. So rest assured, uh, we will be around. But I mean, a part, a part of that's a part of why we need to be working together. We have, as I mentioned, these action teams. Um, and, you know, it's not, this is not a top down dynamic. I just want to say, typically, typically. Well, we're, we're not going to go into that conversation with you. I mean, that's the point. The point is, for us, we want to work toward having something where it's legal, it's out there, there's no, there's, you know, it's it's done in a way where there's safeguards. That's what we're looking for. Yeah. In, in this. And I, I, I mean, yeah, compassionate doctors have always helped their dying patients. This is about bringing this out into the open and, and providing safeguards and process meetings. Doing it right. Yeah, yeah, doing it right. Okay, who's next? This guy here okay, has another question. Yes. Yeah, um, just, just a detail. <coughs> Pardon. You said you're the successor to the old Could Wilmot you get Society? Could people to crank up the heat? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 And, um, and you know, it's evolved over time, obviously, in terms of its strategy. Yeah. Okay. Um, back again. All right. Again. And then over here. All right. Me? Yeah. Uh, I'm so short. I, I'm so short. I didn't see you. I'm sorry. The second when question. When I was a primary caregiver, I discovered that there are all sorts of fiscal, monetary things you have to look after, and my sister even came up with the questionnaire she found on the internet that you ask the dying person their wishes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's any any guidance on that on your side or on another side? Um, in terms of what? In terms of talking with... Uh, recommend, like I made all my bank accounts join. Mm -hmm. You know, is there anybody who's got advice like this? There's a lot of resources on Compassionate Choices on, on all of these issues. So I'd highly recommend that you look at that. I, I mean, I, I have the financial, okay. the primary caregiver, I have yeah. I totally, boy, do I understand. Settled. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I just remember. For me to do right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But there, but it's important. I mean, we are not. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, adult 101. We don't get adult 101. We don't learn how to, you know, get a bank account and do all the financial education. You know, as, as kids, we need training. Frankly, I think we all need training on how to take care of our parents and then take care of ourselves because there's so much to it. So I really appreciate the question but i think a lot of those resources you can find on our website um, i'm going to go here sure, to the, sure. the no the gentleman here because he's been waiting a while and then uh, i'm going to go back here and then i'm going to go to you okay okay yeah you got to wait i heard on the uh, okay. on the news that there was a radio personality uh who's whose who wife moved into oregon so they, he could experience and then now it's all in the, it might all be in the courts because the family that was left behind in California thought that he was being mistreated, abused, and rushed into death. You know what went wrong with that? I I don't think that's a true story. I, I haven't heard anything about that. I mean there's a there's a famous uh, Diane Reem, I think she was on uh, Betty Rollin, uh, they're famous personalities. They've written books about this. They're very strong supporters of compassion and choices. So this was this a guy who used to have a, um, used to have a radio top 40, a very popular radio top 40 show. Didn't hear it. Didn't hear it. Yeah, we'd have to look. They, into yeah, the story. Is, one of the stories that's most uh, widespread yeah. is uh, her name was Brittany Menard. Uh, she was 29 years old. She lived in California with her husband. Um, she developed glioblastoma, an extremely, you know, aggressive form of brain cancer. Horrible way to go. Uh, she and her family picked up and moved to Oregon, established residency. It's not that hard to do, um, and took advantage of the Oregon medical aid and dying law and died peacefully. 
And she was on the cover of People magazine, and she was on 60 Minutes. This was about, about two, and, three and, years and ago. And her husband's really an advocate on, in our organization at this point. He's continuing yeah. to work on yeah. it. But that's, but no, okay. I haven't heard of I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't hear about that one. Yeah, I yeah. didn't either. But maybe, but we'll, I'll look into it. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, you, you and then you. No, first the, the okay, green. Uh, I've already is said the, it. Is so. the uh, plastic okay. bag a good way to commit suicide? Plastic bag. Oh, no, no. I think it was the best way. No, no, no. No, and, and I, and I, it's again. It's in Final Exit. It's in the book. This is something that I really don't want to get into here. Okay, no, I'm sorry. I see, okay. I see what you need, but it's Okay, true. yeah. Okay, sir. Right what do you all think about the case of Terry Schiavo? Anthony. Well, you know, Terry Schiavo was, um, it's not quite, it's really not quite what this movement is about. I mean, she was, um, <laughs> She, let's see, she was a you. young adult, uh, she was brain dead, and uh, her husband went to court to get the breathing devices removed, um, and I think was it her parents who were yes. very opposed to that? Yeah, you know what, the, the, the real uh, meaning, the lesson to be drawn from Terry Schiavo is there was no advanced directive, right. there was yes. no explicit thing saying this was what she wanted, and and I think that's really the crucial thing. No matter how old or how young you are, make sure it's very, very clear who has the right to make those decisions for you and what you would or don't want, and talk to your loved ones about that. That's really it. I, I can't tell you, you know, I talked to my nieces recently about this, and they, I don't know if they'll ever talk to me again, but I, I talked to them about this, um, and, you know, they hadn't done it. And their their dad's a doctor, so um, so you really need to think about um, you know a lot of us you know particularly when you're younger we have that sense of immortality which right. is good you know it's a, it's part of life um, but somehow I think it's it's important I, I know of um, I can't remember which city it is I know it's in Michigan where they made a goal of a hundred percent having advanced directives. Lacrosse. Lacrosse. Was yeah. Wisconsin? Okay. Well, Michigan too. But anyway. One of them. We're not going to say which one because we really don't know. But we know there's a city that did this. And I think those, by the way, I mean, it's important to think about the, these are critical pieces. They're as, you know, to me, they're as significant issues as the aid and dying piece. And we all need to have advanced directives. If you walk away with one thing from this, I hope, you know, you'll all make sure everyone um, that you love and care about have it. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're an adult, you can make a decision about you know how, what when what kind of interventions you want. You know, um, so that's something I just want to say. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, both of my parents are in their 80s. They're both still functioning well, but I know the day is coming soon mm -hmm. when I'm going to have to tell my dad, "Hey, you got to I got to take your keys." Yeah. Do you have, I, I know it's not exactly the death and dying part, but seeing as how you guys deal okay. with the elderly and this topic, yeah, yeah. Okay. How, what is your recommendation? Okay, this is out of my job, okay? This is, this is no, me I'm talking just... as a human being to you, so it's not CNC. I went through this uh, with my mom. Um, she was getting into a bunch of little fender benders, and, you know, she, she's a very independent woman. And, you know, that was great, but she was tough, okay? And I was really concerned about her driving. What I finally figured out is it couldn't be me saying this. What I needed to say to her, I got, first of all, I had her see a gerontologist. And and that gave me an opportunity to talk to a doctor who worked with older people and, ex and explain some of my concerns. We went together. Um, but the other thing is then she agreed to go and get tested for her driving ability. Um, and I said, look, if they say you're okay, then, you know, I'm done. I've done what I have to do. But if they think you're dangerous, you know, they'll, they'll say you don't have a license anymore. So I think that okay. is a nice way to kind of, uh, and this is, again, personal advice, but okay. it's a nice way to make it so it's no. not this conflict between you and the person. Uh, the reason I ask is a pastor of my church recently had to do that with his father. It's really tough. And, you know. Stop. Thank, I, thank, thank you, yeah, though. Thank sure. you. When, when my dad was 98 years old and his driver's license had been taken away and he's tottering down the hall with his walker in the old folks home <laughs> and he's saying to me, your mother won't let me buy a new car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And he loved his new car. It was like every <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So where do we start? Okay. 
Well, the big thing is, I don't know where the sign-in sheet is. Where'd it go? Who's uh, got it? That's it. There's a clipboard. Because it's important. It's right there, I think. Okay. Okay. Sign up. If you haven't signed up, please do. Um, and, and what will happen is, depending on your location, if we have an action team, I'm going to want to get that action leader reaching out to you. Um, if not, I mean, I, I will and Ed will, I mean, we're, we work together very closely, but we'll work with you to get you engaged, you know. And, you know, for example, if you're like a physician, you know, we might want to have you talk to, we have a special, um, you know, project around the medical community, you know. So, um, but what we would do is talk with you and, you know, start to figure all of that out. So please sign, sign up. And if you want to volunteer, make sure to acknowledge that so we know this is someone I need to pick up the phone or I need to pick up the phone and, and, and follow up with you, okay? And we hope you do because, um, honestly, uh, this isn't going to happen because there's a, a national organization. It's going to happen because of you. It's going to happen because of people on the ground making this. It's a, this is a culture change, and that can't happen from here. It has to happen on the ground. Um, so uh, I really would appreciate anyone who wants to work on this to let us know. And, you know, do as much as you want in there. Okay, uh, do we have time for one more? We got some time, uh, yes, for a couple more. Okay, a couple more. Carry on. Yes, yes, sir. By signing this thing, we'll just give them, by signing this paper, we'll just ask you for paperwork to be done on this. Is that I think I think what you can do is, you know, if you want to just say, I just want to get information only from now on, then you'll get on mailing list, okay? If you want to say, I'd like to volunteer, you're still not committing to it. I mean, this isn't a contract. I mean, this is just saying, I'm interested in learning more about what I can do beyond that, okay? Um, back over here. The fellow who was Casey Kaysen. Uh, and there was a tremendous, yeah. tremendous, tremendous You don't know who Casey Kasem is. He Am was, he was a famous, he was the top 40 guy. Yeah, I, I don't know the story, but I'll look it up. Um, okay, thank you for looking that up. Real quick before you, we go into questions, plug your organization, give us its website, and then how we can reach you if they have more information okay. to our web audience. Okay, so it's uh, compassionandchoices.org. Is the website, um, and I'm Amy Sherman, and you can reach me through through that actually. Okay. And, and, the, and the local group in Illinois is called FinalOptionsIllinois.org, and and we are part of the Illinois End of Life Options Coalition, together with Compassion and Choices and the American Civil Liberties Union, and we are just determined this is change that has to happen, and we are. We, we really hope you join us in helping make the change. Let's thank our speakers yeah. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Now we eat. Now you eat. And now it's our infamous rebuttal period time. How many have rebuttals tonight, please? Uh, all right. I looks like we'll do a four-minute clock. Well, I got three, three rebuttals in an hour. Well, Charlie, we'll, I, oh, we'll, we'll go we'll do a five-minute clock then. Okay. Uh, I'll need some help keeping time. If, uh, if there's anybody out there who's got a stopwatch or a smartphone that can uh, kind of help us out, because Andy usually Andy usually does that, you know. And, just give us a signal when it's getting to be five minutes, and I'll uh, if, if we go on a little bit longer or there's excessive rambling, we may, you know. But anyway, I guess I don't want to stay long and get a little bit bloviating, so let's get right to our rebuttals. Good. <laughs> well, at the uh, post office, this is a co-worker of mine, uh, one time, he, he didn't seem depressed or anything, but he asked me, if you were going to commit suicide, how would you do it? And, and I thought it was just like a jokey thing, you know, but I thought about it a little bit. I said, well, I'd, I'd, I'd walk in Lake Michigan and keep walking. And then I thought about it. Why should he ask that? The next day I went to him, I said, so are you thinking about uh, doing so? No, no. But six months later, he was found in Lake Michigan. I feel really feel bad about that. Uh, but uh, some observations about... Uh, end of life is uh, they, they, they freeze your bank account and you need a certificate to get it on, even if you're a beneficiary, you need a, a, a death certificate to unfreeze that account. And uh, if you're a beneficiary, that takes precedence over, over wills. 
uh, like in your uh, CDs or whatever, if you're a beneficiary, that, uh, that takes precedence over wills. And this uh, uh, Gompertz curve, the longer you live, the longer you're likely, if you're 75, you're likely to live, you know, the longer you, and if you think someone's going to ju just drop dead, um, I mean, they might live a long, even though they're very old. And um, the, the peaceful pill, I read this in uh, Final Exit, uh, peaceful pill is what doctors want to have, They're in, they want to legalize it to give you a pill if you want to die. And a lot of medical professionals are for that. And what I was saying about plastic bags, they didn't want to uh, give a, a statement about that, but that was in Final Exit too. The, uh, an ex of, a plastic bag will cut off all your circula all the air, and, and it's a way to die. I knew that a long time ago. And then the DNR, uh, a DNR, uh, do, do not resuscitate. You can get that at the hospital sometimes. You don't have to go to a lawyer like we did. We, had, we got a St. Uh, Joseph. Uh, do not the, the nurse gave it to us, and we just signed it. But the best way to get power of attorney, power of attorney, will make it legal. That your chosen uh, power of attorney will make that that decision for you. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Our next rebutter, please. Well, you got to pass it on, buddy. I did. This way. George, we, did you get it? You dead ended it. it. I know you dead ended it. Well, denial is not a river in Africa. No. It's no. Uh, something that happens to all of us, and I'm certainly one of those. Uh, I have uh, hairy cell leukemia, which will probably call, kill me, but right now my condition is in remission. He didn't say cure, he said remission. Some years ago, before this condition came on me, I wrote a memo with my will, uh, giving my will, uh, which has end of life uh, concerns on it, to uh, my, my church, to my lawyer, to my doctor, to my sister and to a dear friend. So hopefully, uh, when the time comes, I hope to be ready. But this talk certainly helped me. Uh, I thank the speakers. I thank you for your talk. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right, next, please. <clears throat> I support letting folks ease their pain by any reasonable means, including medical aid and dying. Uh, I was re uh, raised to respect my elders, and I don't see how medical aid and dying would conflict with that principle. Uh, however, pushing, shoving, and threatening your elders or letting them suffer in pain is not a means of showing respect. I want the sick and suffering to have uh, that choice, and I certainly would not want to have those ch choices taken away. But to me, philosophically, it kind of raises some dilemmas, for lack of a better word. We consider slavery immoral because humans have dignity, humans own their bodies, and we have inalienable rights. Because rights are inalienable, uh, we cannot or should not own slaves or even sell ourselves into slavery because life and liberty can't uh, even be infringed upon including yourself. Similarly, I can see how one would argue that suicide is immoral because it's immoral to take one's inalienable right to life even by yourself. Again, I'm not saying uh, people should not have end of life choices, all I'm saying is that if rights are inalienable suicide may cause a philosophical dilemma, quote unquote. Don't have the answer, it's just something to think about. Thank you. All right. Next. Just something to think about. What would you like? Yeah. Yeah. This is related, related, because it has to do with death and dying. Many years ago when I was thinking of retirement, um, 
I read a, I read a, I read some an article about it, and to um, bring it up to date, I'm going to change some of the numbers. Pretend that this is 2020, and pretend that you're 50 years old. Okay. Now let's say that you're going to live to be 65, and that you're healthy, and that when you're 65, you're healthy. You come from healthy parents, and everything is like you can. You can actually expect to easily live another 10 years. Well, the way the story goes is, if today is 2020 and you're 50 and you live to be 65 and you're in good health, that year is going to be 2035. What do you think the state of medicine is going to be like in 2035? Well, if the shit doesn't hit the fan, it should be a lot better. Then the question goes, well, let's say you're healthy at 65 which is the year 2035, and you come from good good parents, good stock, and you're, you do everything right, you're going to be, you're going to live, let's say, another five years, to 2040. Not a stretch. What do you think that the state of medicine is going to be in 2040? And then it goes on to like, all right, you're 70 years old, and you're still healthy and everything, and the year is 2040. You're going to live, let's say you live another 10 years, all right, maybe this is a stretch, but you're going to live to be 80 years old, and the year is going to be 2050. What do you think the state of medicine is going to be like in 2050? And then the article concludes with a joke, which is, they're never going to let you die. <laughs> now, I have to visit, I have to visit, um, my mayor, the mayor of our little town, and Illinois suffers from this, and what I have to say to him is this story that I just told you, and then tell him that, you know what, they're never going to let you die. And the pension that you're, that you're relying on is like a wonderful thing, but your son, who's about 25 years younger than you, or 30 years younger than you, who's also in politics, is also never going to be allowed to die. And we're never going to afford it. Okay? I, of course, don't have a problem because I'm not depending on a state pension, so I can move away. But you are screwed. All right? So please get the house in order, because if you do want a pension this less this lasts as long as you are, as you will, you know just straighten this out because it's unsustainable now. Um, and the other story that goes with it is I asked a friend of mine who was about 20 years older than I was, maybe 15. So when I was, when I was 50, he was 65. And I asked him about collecting Social Security. And I said to him, when should I collect Social Security? 62, 66, or 70? And he said, well, if I were you, I'd wait as long as I could, um, depending on your cash flow, of course. And I said, but if I, I don't want to leave any money on the table, I should, shouldn't I get it as soon as I can? And he said, listen, if you die, don't worry about the money, okay? You have to worry about the money if you live a long time. So try to put it off as long as you can. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're your next. It's a loose five minutes. So. A hundred years ago, the poet E. A. Robinson was enormously popular, and today he's just about disappeared. Uh, this poem, "How Annandale Went Out," was published in 1910. They called it Annandale, and I was there to flourish, to find words, and to attend. Liar, physician, hypocrite, and friend, I watched him. And the sight was not so fair as one or two that I had seen elsewhere. An apparatus not for me to mend, a wreck with hell between him and the end, remained of Annandale, and I was there. I knew the ruin as I knew the man. So put the two together if you can, remembering the worst you know of me. 
Now view yourself as I was on the spot with a slight kind of engine. Do you see? Like this. You wouldn't hang me? I thought not. Uh, all right, next. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this reminds me of the story, which I just made up now, about um, the guy who was suffering from incontinence and thought that this was a terrible disease and he was really suffering. And he asked the doctor if he could have aid to assisted death. And the doctor said, depends. <laughs> 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 oh God! <laughs> oh, I, I don't usually come up with that good a joke on the spur of the moment, but, but that's good. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep my mouth near this darn mic. Uh, a little difficult because uh, I move around. But um, um, as a lot of you know, I'm a writer. Writers are incredible egotists. And of course, it doesn't matter how old we are, we think we're going to live forever. We've noticed. It has nothing to do with, <laughs> it just has to do with being a complete and total self-centered jerk. Um, but uh, being that way, uh, that's why I asked the question about, because uh, I've long wondered about, you know, could I at least uh, preserve my body uh, so I could be resurrected, like in one of those science fiction um, uh, novels or, uh, you know, the movie with Woody Allen in it. Um, <clears throat> but, um, um, and uh, so, and, and of course, if Alzheimer's coming, now I really found out this great information that uh, if I'm worried about my brain going, yeah, I could at least, uh, uh, you know, undergo a fast and uh, make myself even more sick so that I could take advantage of this, uh, um, at least uh, create a, uh, what looks like death so that they can at least come in. <laughs> and this is good that if you're, at, uh, at your home as, for hospice, you're not on the road or something, uh, they can come in with their uh, crew and uh, make sure that they preserve the tissues, especially your brain tissue. Um, so that's a great thing to know. Um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate the entire talk. I mean, I, you know, it seems like I'm joking only, but uh, this was very useful information and I'm glad I came um, and found out a lot of good things. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Carl Herbst, uh, also known as Charlie Herbst, uh, He's been to a few of these, but he lives uh, now in Rockford, so he doesn't come very often. Um, but uh, uh, he has long advocated and been an expert about this uh, power of attorney and uh, uh, advocating for people uh, who are in the hospital that can't advocate for themselves and this whole subject. And he's been long encouraging me to do something about it. But because I, um, I, I several times said that um, I uh, would have gotten an Olympic medal for procrastination, but I just wouldn't file the damn forms to, to, to get into the, the uh, competition. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, um, so I hope I've lightened up, up the uh, mood a little bit. Um, uh, another thing you might consider, one might consider, is uh, the best way for suicide is to use Cleopatra's ass. And please, no jokes about her body parts. So, um, now, one more thing. Um, I want to encourage everybody to come to Refuse Fascism's uh, Anti-Fascist Christmas Carols um, on uh, December the 15th, a week from today, uh, from 12 to 3 in Daly Plaza. We did that last year. But I'm going to inconvenience you with singing one of these uh, Christmas carols, which uh, I wrote, alternate uh, lyrics. And uh, we'll see how good I do here. Hope I, I think I have one more minute left. Uh, subpoenas processed in court, please all file. Witnesses flipping as Trump is reviled. Mueller so good, each indictment he brings. These are a few of my favorite things. Stories in the press corps revealing more crimes. Protesters marching so many more times. Congress in real impeachment hearings. These are a few of my favorite things. When the fiends tweet, when the news reeks, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember my favorite things, and then I don't feel so bad. And if that doesn't make you commit suicide, I don't know what will. Well, I'd like to say...
say that uh, with respect to um, a person being allowed to commit suicide, as a libertarian, I think that is our right because that you own your body. So if you want to take drugs or if you want to commit suicide, that should be your right because either you own your body or the government owns your body. It can't be both ways. Uh, I think that, uh, however, in uh, the Gentile Bible, uh, the so-called New Testament, it says that uh, people will beg to be allowed to die. So we could very well be heading for a day when people will be kept alive artificially long, long, long after it would be normal to die now. People might live to be two or three or four hundred years old uh, in the um, not too distant future. Uh, so I think that uh, it's ultimately a person's right to die if they want to die. Uh, and I don't think any laws should exist against that. Now, uh, we just had a guy sing a song, such as it was, and I um, think that if songs are uh, in order, then I have a little song for you. And it goes like this. When I'm worried and I can't sleep, I count my money instead of sheep, and I fall asleep counting my money. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Next rebutter, please. Well, I will open with a joke, and maybe you've heard this one, but we public speakers are always taught to open with a joke. I'm not a public speaker, and my thoughts are all scattered right now, but um, the joke is, okay, so uh, a patient gets a call from his doctor, and the doctor says, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is you've got one day to live, and the bad news is I should have called you yesterday. <laughs> But the point of that is, um, in that case, death happened very quickly and surprisingly. But death is just, and dying is a really inhumane thing. It goes on way too long. Um, I was reminded while listening of the, the movie that won an Oscar award for Best Foreign Film in 2004. Um, Mar Adentro, which is the sea inside. It's the true story that was written by a man who became a paraplegic at age 25, and he spent the next 30 years fighting for his right to do what he did, which was at the end of the movie and his life. It, the movie ends with a party with his friends and loved, loved ones around. I don't know what the long-term ramifications of his his battle um, were in, it happened in Spain, of course, and um, because Wikipedia kept on asking me for money and kicking me out. But um, in any case, this topic is kind of like, it's, it's what has shaped a lot of my life. My husband sometimes says, I like to make people feel bad. But thinking about it right now, I'm thinking, maybe that's my way of pleading for your cause. It's, it's like my mom died of ovarian cancer. The diagnosis took forever to, to come to fruition. She was at a hospital. I won't mention the name because we, we still have hope for the hospital. Um, but um, they were sending her to an orthopedist. And this went on for years. Finally, at the University of Chicago, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And excuse me if this gets really morbid, but just, you know, what she and the family suffered. So I went to visit her, and she was on one of these wheels, 
that helps circulation, and she's screaming on the wheel that's supposedly helping her. And then she, she was a little perky one day when we went to visit. She said, I just had a psychiatrist come to visit me, and she asked all these questions, and she had a team of, of, of students with her, and I'm quite certain that was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, because she, she was there at the university um, at that time. So, um, yeah, it was, I, I went away to college because that's what my mom wanted me, was to stay in school while she was dying, but when I would come home, um, you know, she would show me the tumors on her thighs, and there was screaming in the bathroom, and she asked me to kill her. That's a lot, that's a lot to put on an immature 20, 20 year old. And, you know, there should have been some social worker who would come over with, you know, with a solution to this. And um, it just, it, it shaped my life for a long time because I was depressed in my 20s when you're supposed to be enjoying life. Um, so, oh yeah, and then I didn't go to my proms or dances because like I was a lot of fun to go to a dance with because my mother was dying, you know, so now that's, I'm making light of that. But yeah, just thank you very much. And um, yeah, just thank you and good luck. Um, I, 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 I ask myself the question, where, where does this come from, this idea that you don't have a right to do something with your life? And uh, I don't know if there's any historical research on this question, but off the top of my head, uh, the thought I thought my, the answer that I thought of was uh, religion, that uh, for thousands of years, at least in Western culture, that your life isn't your life. It's, it's really God's choice, and you can't interfere in God's will. And, um, and I just think that this, that I personally, I'm, I'm not a superstitious person, and that leads me to be uh, non-religious. And I think that this is just another small example of what happens when, uh, when superstitious or religious uh, beliefs tend to influence things like public policy and, and the law, things like that. So um, I should probably follow this by saying that I really, I don't think that religious people are inherently evil people. I know that people are very sensitive when a non-religious person criticizes religion. I've known a lot of incredibly kind, wonderful people who are religious, so I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm attacking people, but I, I do think it's fair to, uh, to look at this as, uh, as an example of some of the uh, problems with religion and how it interferes in the health and the happiness of people. I'm going to give quite a contrary view to that thing because I do believe that in, in this palliative care stuff and you know sometimes the best choice is to end suffering. Tomorrow morning I'll be at a place called the Springbrook Community Church. I'll be celebrating the life of Jesus Christ and his redemption of sin and that is my choice. I believe in a heaven, I believe in a hell, and I believe where what you choose about Jesus is ultimately going to determine your final destiny. I believe we're eternal creatures. However, and I do believe it because I do believe I've been able scientifically and with the preponderance of evidence to believe this. Now, for those of I, that doesn't mean I'm not going to respect those who don't believe the same way I do. And. I'm also going to say this, that, uh, you know, so if you do take a look at the evidence, you'll find that I believe it's true. If you look at a book called Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict, it's about 30 years old. He was a freshman in college, and he did, but I'm not going to dwell on that. The thing I do want to dwell on, though, is that this type of palliative care and everything else needs to be heard in our churches. It needs to be heard in our institutions of faith. For example, I'm against abortion myself. I, I just can't see how they can do it. But I also know too that uh, a woman, I'm not a woman. And a woman's got a right to choose her own things. If she wants to choose to 
kill her own offspring, you know. That's her, I don't know if it's her right, but I tend to believe in also in like birth control and women, you, you have a choice to say no during that act. But I also know too that there are situations where it, it happens. And uh, sometimes there are children who are not wanted. I just hope that they go to a place like a pregnancy center that, that can offer adoptions and other alternatives because what the only thing that really scares me about this whole palliative care thing is that we have to come from a culture of life. We have to believe that life is, 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 is a gift from God in a sense that we all deserve to live, we all deserve to have a peaceful life, we all deserve to do the best we can as it says in the Constitution, life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I also believe that we do need to provide some kind of universal health care, uh, some sort of social safety net with the way the economy is going and, and other things. And you're talking to a guy who's a capitalist, I just sometimes think that the, that the over-reliance on government benefits might be to our own detriment. I do believe in some, but not at all. It's just a matter of degree, you know. To make a long story short, this argument has gone on for a long, long time. The old Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, in a book, uh, and it was called the, I, it was a, oh, the screw tape letters. It was how a senior guide, how a senior yeah. devil instructed a junior devil in the art of temptation. Right. And one of those letters said, make sure their deaths are long and horrible because finally they'll want to come to us. Not that they have to, but they'll want to come to us down below. And that guy above with his eternal love, he'll be cast into doubt. So we're not the first to be speaking about palliative care. It was mentioned as early as the 1920s in some of the greatest literature ever made. And you know, I think maybe C.S. Lewis may have been right. To, to end this, I have a personal story of a friend of mine. Many of you know her from as Allie. Uh, she was a friend of mine and 50 years old, she was fit as a fiddle. Always had some medical issues, but she finally got diagnosed with a disease called scleroderma. And it was a horrible disease to have because at 50, she was fit as a fiddle. Her college roommate died because she was on dialysis and her plate popped out. Then her husband had stage four brain cancer and she was doing everything she could for him. And I think when he finally died, she was just exhausted. The next thing you know, she spent 94 days in, this, in the uh, intensive care unit that uh, I think it was the hospital on 55th Street. I think that's University of Illinois. University of Chicago. University of Chicago. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, but I got to know her, several people in the Scleroderma Foundation, and I still attend some of their group meetings because I find that it's very educational just to know a little bit about what death and dying is all about. And some of these women who have incredible stories, how they've lived with this thing for 20 years, and just you, how fragile life can be sometimes. And I, I really honestly think that we all need to care about those who can't help themselves to love one another as best you can and to, and to try to promote some sense of balance and whatever and try to live a moral and ethical life because I think we're all going to be much, much better in the long run. I'm sorry to have gone a little over, but thank you for listening to me. One more. Okay, you got one more before you ramble. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, um, I heard Dave talk about, uh, Dave was blaming religion for the uh, opposition to, uh, to the speakers tonight. Um, and there's a lot of people who say things like that, Bill Maher, for example. But um, there's most, I'm not a religious person. 
but most people in the world have some kind of a religion, some kind of religious belief, uh, and people are people are different religions. They're all over the place on on these issues and on many others. Uh, so you really shouldn't generalize. I'll get, just to give you an example. Uh, my dad's um, even my dad's an ordained Lutheran minister, and a few years ago, um, his mom who was age 99, uh, got very sick and was in the hospital. And, um, and I, went down to, I went down to Tennessee to visit my parents and my grandmother, uh, his, his mother. And uh, before, I got, before they let me in, my dad warned me, Don, no, you know, she, Grandma looks a, lot old, looks a lot different now, but you know, no matter what you think, don't don't say anything. Don't don't freak out. Don't uh, you know? Uh, just stay calm. And I went in. It was hard to do because uh, my she looked terrible. I mean, it was um, she was all hooked up to these machines and everything. She was on a life support system. Oh my gosh! Um, she tried to take her own oxygen mask off. Uh, and my brother, who actually is a doctor, tried to put it back on her, and she tried to take it off. And, um, and eventually he said to us that, um, that she doesn't want to live. So we ended up having, they ended up having, having, the, um, having the doctors take her off life support and she died. And, and, um, and, and it was, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that my dad is less religious than the people, uh, you know, the, the the people who who are are against, who are in favor of putting, keeping people on life support systems forever. Doesn't mean my dad's less. Doesn't mean my mom or my brother are less religious. It's got not that has. Uh, and now, I um, by the way, I did visit Al. I, I visited Tim. Allie was a friend of mine too. I visited Allie before she died. She looked terrible, although she was actually a whole lot better off than my grandmother was. But I did visit her at University of Chicago Hospital uh, uh, before she died. And um, uh, Tim, I noticed that you were saying that um, you you were talking about about women using birth control being bad. Uh, no, I didn't say that. What do you think? Well, now, what do you think about men using birth control? I think it's a good idea too. Okay. Um, all right. Anyway. Um, Anyway, I guess that's all I want to talk about. All right. Okay. Any other rebuttals? Anyone? All right. All right, Charlie. I was busy, but uh, I want to thank. Let's thank both our speakers coming in and fulfilling on short notice. Um, this topic. You, apparently, I haven't listened to all the rebuttals, but you seemingly have covered all the topics. Um, the only thing is, the primary caregiver, the one experience I had not too long ago, was, and I am not one, if I don't understand something, and I even do this at hearings or in court, and I cite case law and so forth, if I don't know it, I tell the hearing officer, the judge, or, I say, sir, I, I, I don't know what that is. I will admit ignorance, which a lot of people will not do. And you're given the responsibility of making decisions, but I have little or no knowledge of the healthcare industry, medical technology, the equipment, and things of this nature, and I felt totally uh, inadequate towards making a decision. I don't know if there's any solution to that, but to say the choice is yours. And very often there's the individual, you, you are the person responsible for making the choices. And I must admit in hindsight now I made some bad choices. Actually extending the life was possibly, in one respect I look upon as a bad choice in that, in the fulfillment of my duties in that occasion. Now Timothy, I used to think that People going to church once a week was a good thing because I said at least they're getting some. We have a group here, an adjunct of philosophy group. It's been around since as long as the college almost. 
and we meet once a month to discuss philosophical topics. And I used to think that uh, this was good at least. I don't really care for organized religion or the priestly class, I will call it. But I said people were going at least once a week and getting a lecture on ethics. But then again, I began thinking about what sort of ethics they are listening to. <laughs> and I'm very serious about this. You, I don't want to kill the messenger, but whatever you hear from the pulpit, I would discount or devalue. And I mean this because there are many people without credentials, without qualifications, or they may feel some divine inspiration. Or they may base it on truth by revelation. Or they may have no background or training whatsoever. One of the most complex areas is biomedical ethics. And I know because there's reference books and encyclopedias on this. It's a very, very complicated area can get into. And I doubt very much that many of these individuals are making pronouncements and dictating what is in essence, what is right or wrong, have no back, background or training in it. And worst of all, I think some of them are not qualified to make any pronouncement on ethics whatsoever because they're using these reference or antiquated standards of the ancients and uh, things. I, I won't get into Christian ethics or, or some other ethics of organized religions, but I, I don't give it much uh, of a score, let's put it that way. But if you choose to do so, and you seek guidance from these individuals, let the, let the buyer beware. But anyhow, thank you very much for coming in. We'll have to have you folks again sometime. Okay. You guys get the last word. Thank you so very, very, very much. Um, we really appreciate this. Um, visit us at CompassionAndChoices.org or and or FinalOptionsIllinois.org. And um, okay, so I got to close with a story. Um, there was this very elderly gentleman. He had, he was a collector of gold coins. He had like twenty million dollars of gold coins, and he put in his will. He said, "I want you to." bury them with me and he died and you know the kids were sitting around talking about it and the kids said look let's not crowd the old gentleman we'll just write him a check so, thank you <laughs> all right how about our other organizer how about our other person get up there and I don't have a funny story no but so just close us out you got a chance to get the last word in on the rebuttals it's not often you get a chance to rebut the rebutters and take the rest. I don't worry about anybody. I think everybody has a right to their own opinion. Well, then let but us know. But I would ask that those of you who have concerns about it, keep your mind open and learn more and explore the topic more. Because I think as you think about this, you'll realize it's, it's not a mandate. It's an option. And that it's something that's really about being human and humane. And so... Hopefully, you know, we've given you enough information to get you kind of thinking about that. And uh, but we live in a country where people have different views, and that's okay. Go ahead and close us out then by hitting the... All right, you have to do this? Okay. College adjourn. College adjourn. Okay. Thank you. Okay.